Coming up on Sue Does America, it's the voter suppression that never was in Georgia. Mm, Drew Holden, master of Twitter threads, is here to talk about that. AOC gained a fiance this month, but she may be breaking up with her car. And we'll dive into that tragedy in just a little bit. And the left is bringing back Old Faithful, meaning they're going to blame all of the country's problems on the GOP and the NRA. Let's get at the actual facts and do the left's NRA lies. I'm gonna have to level with you here and admit something. Confessional time here on Studios America. I'm getting to the point with Beto O'Rourke, like Cuomo level hatred. That is, I, I, it is rising every single day. This guy sucks. I hate him in every way. He is human scum. Just letting, letting you know right off the bat. That's, I was, if you listen to the radio show today, I, Almost just dropped an f bomb in the middle of the show, talking about Beto. That's it's where I am with this guy. Uh, he's he drives me absolutely insane. He is like the epitome of the worst thing our society can produce. That is Beto O'Rourke, and of course he's the nominee for governor in the state. Of course he is. Of course he is. I can't wait to watch him lose. But it's going to be a fun few months until that actually happens. And of course, until then, he will do what he has done until he, every, every single second since he uh, came into the limelight a few years ago, which is try to get attention for himself at any cost. At any point, no matter what the cost is, no matter who he is hurting, no matter how much he is lying, he will focus on getting control of your attention and have your eyeballs pointed at him because that's what he loves. He loves power. He loves money. He loves attention. Oh, my God, he craves it. We showed you the clip yesterday of him interrupting the press conference and, you know, tr- just trying to build his campaign on the backs of 19 dead children. That's that's 100 percent what he was doing. Uh, at some point, they had a meeting beforehand and they were like, hey, how how can we get higher in the polls and get some donations on the backs of these children? I know we'll go down there and we'll make a spectacle of a press conference while families are grieving. Won't that be fun? We'll get into that in a second. Of course, he did this as well. Governor Abbott, if you have any decency, you will immediately withdraw from this weekend's NRA convention and urge them to hold it anywhere but Texas. What the the hell would that accomplish exactly? Moving an event from Houston, uh, an event, by the way, that does not encourage violence against children. As we all know, this idiotic NRA obsession that the left has and mainly and we'll get into why they have it. But it's just mainly laziness. You know, it's 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 just laziness more than anything else. Now, before we do that, however, I do need to highlight this report from CBS. We talked about the Beto uh, situation where he interrupted the press conference and tried to get attention for himself. And we talked about how this would have needed to be planned in advance and all of this stuff. It's not like he was sitting there the entire time. Obviously, people would have noticed him sitting there. He's running for governor of the state. Uh, Well, he was eventually escorted out of the room, and then all the reporters, of course, dutifully gathered around him to hear all of his important points. And one of the important points he made was this was just, it just happened. I mean, I just got so upset at that press conference that I just absolutely had to speak out. And that's that's not a lie. Certainly not 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 me covering for trying to get attention uh, after a tragedy. That's the truth. Well, here is the report from CBS who watched the whole thing happen. Listen to this. I did see what happened just before the press conference started. I was in the third uh, third uh, aisle, um, third row on the aisle, rather, and there were two people across the aisle from me, and a moment before the press conference started, they got up from their seats when Beto walked in. So they were 
seat holders for him. Oh. And then he sat down. So his presence wasn't really noticed in the 15 or 20 minutes that people were gathering inside because he was not in the room. So this seems something very clearly staged by Beto O'Rourke and his campaign wanting to confront the governor at this moment. Right, Robert Francis, right? Obviously, clearly staged. He put seat holders there. And I want you to think about exactly how that went down. That two people went in there and grabbed seats so they could hold them, so that Beto could exploit the deaths of 19 children and two teachers for his own benefit and fundraising. And then, I don't know, maybe they were on the phone and they got a little text, Beto's walking down the aisle, it's time for you to get up. And then they got up in a coordinated fashion and then this douche did his douchery. This man sucks. That's not what this monologue is about though. And now I'm already five minutes into it. Um, Bernie Sanders, you might say to yourself, hey, You can't just pick on Beto because he's the dumbest Democrat, like you found the dumbest Democrat in the world, and you're picking on him with his terrible points about the NRA. And that's a fair criticism, but of course everybody's making it. Bernie's saying it. Enough is enough. We must abolish the filibuster and pass gun safety legislation now. Not in America, days of AR-15. How many more children, mothers, and fathers need to be murdered in cold blood before the Senate has the guts to ban assault weapons and take on the NRA? Is there anything this guy doesn't want to remove the filibuster over? I want ham sandwiches! Abolish the filibuster! That's all this guy wants to do every single day. Um, This is a completely ridiculous narrative from the left. And it's been ridiculous forever, but it's even more ridiculous now. This idea that the reason we don't solve this problem, which is so easy to solve, wiping out the one elementary school shooting every 10 years is obviously super easy to do, and everyone knows how to do it. It's, of course, shockingly vote for Democrats and endorse all of their bills, and then this would all be solved until it wasn't, and then you needed to vote for more Democrats. We really need to do a circle of grift. On, on this because it completely applies here when it comes to the left. And this is what they're doing, right? They're saying it's the NRA and the, the gun lobby, President Biden said it the other day as well, it's the gun lobby who gets in the way. And these restrictions would solve this problem. But the left doesn't, the right doesn't want to solve the problem. They'd rather just kowtow to the NRA's whims. I want to dive into this a little bit because it's completely wrong in every way. And I want to start with someone on the left pointing this out, because this is a big factor. The argument has never been true, but at the same time, the argument has never been less true. Okay. The NRA is an organization that has done a lot of good things for Second Amendment rights over the years. We've had many other people on the radio show. We like them. Okay, they're one of several gun organizations that we like and support, generally speaking, around here at the Blaze. That being said, they're in they're in the middle of a tough time. They've had a lot of issues at the NRA. And this is not the the time where the NRA is the strongest they've ever been. Uh, This is from Mike Spies. He points out it's not 2013. The Republican Party is no longer beholden to the NRA. It does not need to stand up to the gun lobby. The NRA hasn't made significant election outlays since 2016 and won't be able to again for some time. It's still mired in a costly lawsuit with a New York AG. Its longtime PR firm, which served as the voice of the organization and divided Wayne Pierre's persona is long gone. Its most effective spokespeople are long gone. Its most effective leader, Chris Cox, is long gone. Cox's team is gone. Oliver North is long gone. At this stage, any decision the GOP makes is its own. Now, that kind of highlights the difference between past years and where we are now. It doesn't really address the fact that the entire argument is silly on its face. So let's look into into that uh, just a little bit. The NRA has group has their own funding and they have outside groups that they work with to put money into elections. And they do uh, spend more than any other gun group does when it comes to elections. Let me take again a left wing, a left wing source here to highlight exactly how much they spent. This is in 2020. The NRA spent $28.5 million on all elections inside and outside the organization 
uh, the, the super PACs, the outside spending groups, and uh, direct funding, $28.5 million. Now, every town USA and other anti-gun groups spent $21.6 million. So you see there about a $7 million difference. As they point out at thetrace.com, the NRA spent 19% more than gun reform form groups uh, so far. That, oh, that was the end of the year number. So $7 million. So now you think about that and you're saying, okay, $7 million, that difference is a lot. $28 million overall. It's a lot of money. Maybe the GOP really does kowtow to the NRA. They see all this money coming in. They have all this influence. This is what you're supposed to believe. You probably don't believe it because you're smart, but this is what you're supposed to believe. This is what every other post on Instagram says. This is what every politician on the left says. This is what every Pinterest post probably says as well. However, we should probably note that that is a, an absolute pittance when it comes to our election process. $28.5 million and a $7 million advantage on gun spending is basically nothing, okay? The Democrats far outspent the GOP in 2020. Uh, $8.4 billion compared to only $5.3 billion for Republicans. So Democrats outspent Republicans by... A, over $3 billion. Yes, the NRA had a $7 million advantage over uh, anti-gun groups. Does that even make a dent into what we're talking about here? In fact, the 2020 election was the most expensive election in history. Over $14 billion were spent. And these people want you to believe that they, the GOP is making decisions because of $28 million in funding or a $7 million advantage on gun issues. Could anyone that understood the information possibly believe that case? It is the dumbest thing anyone could ever consider, yet it is the main argument being made post uh, the Texas shooting the other day. And it's the same argument being made every single time someone uses a gun to do something bad. It is not what is going on and is not actually real. And, you know, the problem with all of this is they actually know in the media that this isn't real. They might not put all the pieces together, but they actually know it. And I want to give you an example of this. This is from the Washington Post, uh, their flagship podcast. And they do a story every day. It's about 20 minutes. And they cover some big story of the day talking to one or two of their reporters. And yesterday was the story about, of course, the shooting. And so they talked to a guy who has one of their main reporters who's been covering uh, shootings, uh, school shootings largely, uh, since for the last like five years. He's like their main guy put together the database you've probably seen. This is this is his description of what's going on. And he tries to blame the NRA. But I want you to listen closely to his actual argument here. Listen. So, you know, there were a few things that they pushed hard for in the aftermath of Sandy Hook. And one of the primary things was universal background checks. That is always the policy that comes up first. And that's in part because Americans overwhelmingly support it. The polls consistently show that 90% plus of Americans support universal background checks, mm. and that includes a majority of gun owners that they support universal background checks. Mm. That is a thing that, you know, the Senate won't even take a vote on. Mm -hmm. You know, what so much of this ultimately comes down to is, is the influence of the gun lobby. Uh, it is the is. influence of gun manufacturers who do have considerable sway over some number of senators, Why? especially in conservative areas. Why? You know, they don't want to be labeled as gun grabbers. Mm. They don't want to be labeled as anti-gun. Okay, that's interesting. Let's unpack that a little bit, shall we? Universal background checks is the first thing that is always brought up. Of course, that's a dumb thing to bring up in this case because the shooter had a background check. So universal background checks would not have made him more background checked than he already is. He got, went through the background check process and bought the guns anyway. So the background check thing would do absolutely nothing whatsoever to deal with this particular issue. But yes, some polls do show that about 90% of people support 
these universal background checks. Why do they show that? Well, people don't understand that almost every gun purchase already goes through a background check. Most people don't buy guns, uh, so they don't know how that process works. And so, yes, there is a very tiny amount of gun purchases who go around this process. But as far as I know, none of them have ever been used in a mass shooting at a school. Literally never occurred. So the universal background check rule is Silly. It does nothing to solve this problem and would do absolutely nothing in this particular incident. Um, and then he goes into, and this is what's really important to understand. The influence on the, of the gun lobby is the, is the problem, they say. The influence of the gun lobby. Fascinating. Well, as he goes on, and I'm going to give you the quote, ultimately it comes down to the influence of the gun lobby. It's the influence of gun manufacturers have considerable sway over senators. And they don't want to be labeled as gun grabbers. They don't want to be labeled as anti-gun. Now, you just told me that 90%, these are overwhelmingly popular proposals. 90% of people support them. Even gun owners support them. So why would they be worried about being labeled anti-gun or gun grabbers? Because it's not the anti-gun people who are even making these arguments. The people on the left and the media who make these arguments don't even mean them. It's not the people in the gun lobby who are making this influence. It's the people behind them. It's the people they represent millions and millions and millions of voters who are represented by the NRA. The reason why these senators go along uh, with uh, opposing these gun control rules outside of constitutional concerns and very often their own personal views is because they know their voters don't want them to do it. It's not because the NRA says that, because they throw a few dollars here and there. It's because millions and millions and millions of people are standing behind those organizations. Millions of them are members of those organizations, and millions more support the same ideas. That's where the influence is. That's where the influence is. Look, the truth is that the media swallows the leftist trope about the gun lobby hook, line, and sinker. And they repeat it without an ounce of critical thought because they know it provides an easy, great narrative. It's a lazy way to tell the story. Oh, there's a shadowy cabal of money men in the back room, back there smoking their cigars, manipulating our politics because they want more money and more power. They are stopping all of these easy, common sense solutions that we all know would work because they prioritize themselves over the possibility of dead children at an elementary school. This is a disgusting, revolting lie. It's among the worst accusations in all of our politics. It's worse than being called a racist or a homophobe or a transphobe. You're saying we want dead kids to please a few guys at the head of a gun lobby? The truth is that the gun lobby is not powerful because it has money or even relationships with powerful people. It's powerful because it represents millions and millions of voters. Despite all the terrible press the NRA receives all the time, half of the country still likes them. Here's the poll. Uh, 18% find them very favorable. Another 30% find them mostly favorable. Overall, it's 48-49, split pretty much right down the middle on positive or negative feelings about the NRA. It's not the gun lobby. It's half the country standing behind them. Despite what the media is telling you, you know, that we all know these solutions to these problems. We all know that those solutions are, of course, gun control. Well, look at the polling on that. If new gun control laws were passed, do you think it would reduce the number of mass shootings in the U.S.? A great deal, a moderate amount, a little, or not at all? The number one answer to that question is not at all. 42% say that. Another 16% say only a little. If you look at the positive and negative and summarize them, it's 58% say little to no effect and only 41% say it would actually do much of anything. And if you know anything about this issue, which if you're on the left, you probably don't. 
But if you happen to do at least a little bit of your research, you probably know that these evil assault weapons account for a minuscule percentage of gun-related murders in this country. They don't want to get rid of AR-15s. They want to get rid of everything. Why do you think they're always talking about other countries that have essentially no privately owned firearms? Why do they idolize them so much? One difference between us and them is that we have a second amendment. To emulate these other countries, we'd have to get rid of the second amendment. And the reason the left doesn't say that is because they know how you feel about it. Let me give you a poll that is not about eliminating the Second Amendment completely. You could still have maybe a shotgun in this scenario, but just getting rid of handguns. Do you think there should be a law that would ban the possession of handguns except by the police and other authorized persons? Yes, there should be that law, 19%. No, there should not be that law, 80%. That's not the gun lobby speaking, guys. 80% of people do not want private ownership of just handguns to go away, 80%. The left and the media hate to admit it, but what is stopping them from implementing their Second Amendment violations dressed up as common sense reforms is not the gun lobby. It's the American people. And if you think your Second Amendment rights are going to be safe forever. Think about the court. There is a big case in front of the Supreme Court right this second, and it's going to be coming out soon. And right now, the Supreme Court has a nice makeup to it, doesn't it? Seems to make pretty constitutional decisions. Well, the left hates that, and what they want to do is pack the court and change that. Make no mistake, this court packing idea from the left is a coup. It really is. The usual suspects, Biden, Pelosi, Schumer, they're all working overtime on a new radical plan to pack the Supreme Court. And if we don't stop them from installing four more justices or even more than that so they can rig the system in their favor, it will be catastrophic uh, for our court, for our country, for our way of life. I mean, talking about what's gone on just this week, if that doesn't explain it to you, uh, I don't know what would. That's why you need to join with the First Liberty Institute. We've talked about them many times. They do fantastic work on religious liberty and everything related to the court. Uh, they're gathering a coalition of a million patriots to say no to court packing, no to the liberal agenda, no to the Supreme Court coup. Franklin Graham, uh, Ed Meese, James Dobson, uh, Family Policy Alliance, the Heritage Foundation, over 400,000 people just like you are on board. You can sign your name now. Go to SupremeCoup.com, SupremeCoup.com, and sign First Liberty's letter. It's SupremeCoup.com, SupremeCoup.com. Happy to welcome Drew Holden back to the program. He's a staff writer for the Washington Free Beacon. Be sure to check out his latest piece, Oops! Media warned of Jim Crow 2.0. Now black turnout is soaring. I'll tweet out a link to it uh, shortly. Drew, how's it going? Congrats on the gig, by the way. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. It's, it's going well, Stu. How about you? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, your piece uh, is great. It has an incredible amount of, of uh, ridiculousness from the left. <laughs> and this one is particularly infuriating because, uh, you know, you look at the reaction to the Georgia election law, and it was really o over the top. I mean, the Jim Crow 2.0 is kind of the most famous one. We have the Joe Biden one from your piece, uh, Biden on GOP voting restrictions. This makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle. <laughs> just the Jim Eagle. Just amazing. <laughs> greatest line of all time. Yeah. No one understands what he's talking about as usual. But like, right. that really was the tone of it. Like, this was the end of democracy if this yes. Georgia law goes through. And can you kind of take us back to those days and remind everybody yeah. how dire this was? Yeah, that's fair, because it's easy to forget, I think, in the in the wake of everything all that's happened since, because we moved pretty quickly past this one. But back when Georgia had originally instituted these new rules, which were just meant to make the election a little bit more secure, as folks remember, I'm sure, coming out of the 2020 election, there were a lot of concerns that in states across the country, the elections actually weren't particularly secure and that there were issues, there were irregularities, uh, and people weren't happy about them. And so a few different states took measures to try and make things look a little bit better. And so one of those was Georgia. What ends up happening in the blowback to that is that legislators from all across the country, talking heads from all across the country, absolutely lost their minds too. I think my favorite, actually, I'll quote it here directly, 
was from Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey, who said that it was a large step away from democracy and freedom and a step towards authoritarianism and repression. <laughs> Holy crap. Simply be- exactly. Simply because Georgia passed a law that tried to tighten up who could vote and whether the people who were voting were actually the people who they said that they were. Yeah, you know, we spent a good amount of time when we were going through this going over the law. And, you know, look, these were right. minor changes and, and in most cases, changes that opened up election access from pre-COVID right. levels. So, you know, mm-hmm. 2018, you compare it to 2018. These are mostly like adopting some of the new reforms that happened because of COVID. This should have been right. something the left was happy about, I think. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the other interesting things, Stu, is when you compare the rules in Georgia, particularly around how many days of early voting access there were in Georgia versus other Democratic controlled states, Georgia was actually doing pretty well. Right. I mean, they had considerably more early voting than like, I don't know, Delaware, where Joe Biden is from, which has incredibly restrictive early voting. And so when you really run all the metrics of the way different elections could be open and accessible and free and all the other buzzwords you wanna throw out there, they were actually doing okay by every measure. And yet you had democratic politicians and of course media who very quickly picked up the, you know, the, the lingua franca saying, this is Jim Crow 2.0. This is the end of the world. This is the end of democracy as we know it here in America. Mm, it's just unbelievable. Let me give you a couple more from your piece. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Stacey Abrams, Jim Crow in a suit and tie. Stacey yeah. Abrams condemns yep. slate of GOP voter suppression laws. Again, I mean, right. it's important to note the second part of this because it's, it's easy to laugh at Stacey Abrams yeah. and Jim Crow in a suit and tie. But this news source, The Independent in this case, stating mm-hmm. this is a GOP voter suppression law with no exactly. just in, including the judgment in the headline. Right, exactly. And, you know, I think one of the one of the most incredible things about this quote from Abrams is that there were at least three different outlets. CNN, Washington Post, and MSNBC, who all picked up that quote and had it as their headline. Mm. That was their headline, Jim Crow in a suit and tie. I mean, like, I know we talk a lot about whether or not the media is doing too much editorializing. And I think there's probably, there's good points on both sides of that debate. But when you're coming out and just quoting, not just something that a politician is saying, but something that is completely unmoored from the truth, that a politician is saying and using that to describe a law that just got passed. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And we're seeing this happen with so many uh, more and more. And, uh, you know, again, yeah. you can have a lot of people ha- don't like Donald Trump. But one thing I think Donald sure. Trump did accomplish was and this is not a, a good change is taking the media from hiding whatever left wing bias they had and just saying that, look, this Mm -hmm. is too important. We need to just say these things. I mean, you saw it with the Florida law when they were just calling it the don't say gay law as if that was the name of it. Uh, You know, we covered a story the other day from the primary where David Perdue said something about quoting Stacey Abrams about race. And it was just called a racist remark in every news source. No, no conversation about why it's racist or whether it's racist or that people are accusing it of being racist. It was just it is. Is racist. The, 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 exactly. the trial has already occurred and they're guilty. Right. It's accepted as fact that things that Democrats are alleging Republicans are doing or saying or being are just true, that these are things that we have all mutually agreed to. It is as blue as the sky. And that's, I mean, that's just not, that's not a way that a healthy democracy operates. No, no, not at all. Uh, I want to give you one more from your piece. Uh, Georgia election law prevents African-American Latinx others from (laughs) exercising the right to vote, written by Sheila Jackson Lee. We'll leave the Latinx conversation to another day. But I'm curious, uh, how did this turn out? Were minorities allowed to vote in the Georgia primary? It's a great question, Stu, because if the answer was no, that absolutely would have had to lead off the segment, right? And <laughs> right. Un- <laughs> yeah, unfortunately for the writers of the headlines of this piece, uh, one of the things that we found very quickly from the Florida election is that not only were black folks and people of color still able to vote, they actually did so in overwhelming <laughs> numbers early on in the primary. And so we, we had some of the early numbers come back. Early voting in Florida, or sorry, in Georgia was up 300% before the election. 
And it was up over 100% just for the black population who we were told would no longer have any rights in this Jim Crow 2.0 system. So not only were they not only were their allegations not quite confirmed by the data when it came in, <laughs> it couldn't possibly have punctured the narrative more equivocally. It's uh, it, it was something to see come back. No. I knew I know, when I first when I first saw this the story starting to get headlines, I was like, you know, eventually this is going to go bust. I just have to wonder how badly it will go bust. And I don't know how it could have gotten any worse than this. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. In a functioning country uh, that is designed in the way ours is, the media would, if they made a claim like this, and then the data came right. out, would theoretically come out and say, wow, we blew this yeah. one. Like, this did not, yep. we really thought this was going to ruin the right to vote. And I don't know what changed here, but we obviously got this one wrong. We're sorry. We're yep. going to examine why that occurred. Has any of that exactly. happened? <laughs> No, uh, no, unfortunately, Stu, none of that has happened. I agree. What should have happened was the media would have had to second guess the things that they said. And then I think probably more importantly, gone back and second guess the experts who they relied on to give them this narrative. Right. Because I think what really happened was there were a whole bunch of experts who were trusted to make sweeping claims about the impact of a law that just were never true. Right. We're never actually even all, clo all that close to true. And so what this should have been would be a great moment for the media to look at these election experts who they trust for these sorts of prognostications and say, I'm not quite sure that you're one, uh, very bright or two, operating in good faith. We haven't seen any of that. No one's second guessed any of that. There's, there has been no, no looks at how these predictions could have gone so terrible. And honestly, I think if we, if we were to, to, to even you know, use just a smidge of integrity and honesty about why, the answer is they asked a whole lot of partisans what they thought might happen, and they self-handicapped in a way that if things had gone badly in the election, they would have an easy out, and everything went fine. <laughs> and, and better than expected. I mean, I mean it, yeah, it, yeah. It really was fascinating. And especially like, you know, the, the, the black Democrat vote was way up, even though they didn't yes. have a competitive primary. There wasn't even anything really That's to bother voting for. Right. That's the other important part of this is that there weren't there, there wasn't much on the ballot. Right. You don't you don't have all of these questions. You don't have interesting people. You don't have it, it, you know, it's not a presidential election. Right. And they've got numbers that are out and beating the 2020 presidential election in the primary. I mean, there is every reason for why this election should have kind of been a nothing burger. And yet the numbers are, are way out there. Really incredible. Uh, Drew, I want to get your uh, take yeah. on the on the uh, Georgia primary generally, because it was really a fascinating fascinating one to watch. We had Donald Trump yeah. really pushing hard for uh, against Brian Kemp and for David Perdue, against Brad Raffensperger. Right. Uh, you had, uh, you know, all of this going on. And I think when when Trump really put this as the top of his marquee uh, to to mm -hmm. focus on, I think myself included thought at the very least we'd see a pretty close election and that Brian Kemp yeah. was probably in a good deal of trouble. Certainly Brad Raffensperger yeah. was. And then. Sure. The election happens and Kemp wins by 50 points. Like what, what happened here? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I, Stu, I went in thinking the same way that you did, where I was like, you know, maybe, maybe Kemp still pulls it out. He's an incumbent. He's got all these advantages. People seem to really like him down in Georgia. But I mean, having the former president who's quite popular in Georgia and everywhere else come out and really swing very hard against you. That's got to hurt your odds to be able to win, even if it's a re-election. And he coasted. I mean, it, it couldn't have possibly <laughs> been an easier, uh, you know, an easier primary for him. And I think one of the things that that tends to happen, you know, I, speaking of of revisiting and second guessing the uh, the assumptions that people tend to make when it comes to elections, I found myself kind of looking in the mirror and saying, "Man, maybe I'm overestimating." the long-standing impact of someone like Trump and what he'll mean when he's out of office. Mm. Obviously, a lot of people, myself included, underestimated him on the way in, but maybe the phenomena doesn't have this kind of meteoric power that people like me, I think, in D.C. like to ascribe to it sometimes. And maybe he was just a popular president who helped break the mold, but that maybe people in Georgia are ready to go back to something they're a little bit more familiar with. And maybe it's not the sort of thing where just because he has a prognostication that it's going to move heaven and earth. Yeah, you know, it's, it's fascinating to watch. I mean, it's really, the whole thing has been fascinating. Uh, I, yeah. and, and I will end this, Drew, with my favorite fact from the Georgia primary, which was the entire 14th district voted for 
both Brian Kemp, Brad Raffensperger, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Which is <laughs> right. the right. most inexplicable <laughs> thing I can even imagine. Right. But I think that's part of it, right? Like, I think, I think part of the point is that, Stu, for, for people like us who are politicos, who are in the know on all of these things, to us, it's inconceivable, right? Because we think these people are so different. But maybe to a lot of people in Georgia and other places, those are just the R's on the ballot. And all of the kind of internecine wars of the Republican Party aren't actually as, uh, you know, as, as life defining as, as people like myself in D.C. like to sometimes pretend that they are. Yeah, I think I think that's the tr- it, that and plus incumbency is very helpful. And you should try- and incumbency is. <laughs> Very powerful. <laughs> yes, Drew Holden, a staff writer for the Washington Free Beacon. You can head over to uh, my Twitter feed right now to check out his newest piece, Oops, Media Warned of Jim Crow 2.0, and now Black Turnout is soaring. And, of course, make sure to follow Drew on Twitter to get uh, all of his threads and all of his pieces as well. Drew, thanks for coming on the program. Stu, pleasure's mine, sir. Thank you. Ah, that world of cryptocurrency. It's been a bit of a roller coaster lately. I don't know if you happen to notice that. Uh, in fact, it's been honestly a roller coaster since the very beginning. Uh, Tika Tuari came on our show back in like 2016 and was talking about, "Hey, we think Bitcoin's going to go crazy. We're going to give you, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to go up to 10, 20,000." And people didn't believe it. It hit 20,000, and then, as you might remember, it crashed. And Tika came on and said, "This is not the end." This is not the end of this. It's going to go up to 40,000. And again, nobody believed him. And then it went up to 69,000. I think we're over right around 30,000 now. But still, it's outperformed basically every asset if you've held it for any more than six or seven months uh, over the past uh, 10 years. So, hey, if you haven't bought Bitcoin, realize that you're still super early in this uh, in this game. If you're interested in it, do your own research. Make sure you understand it. But don't wait. Sign up for Tika's Palm Beach letter right now at BigTReport.com. BigTReport.com. It's Tika Tawari's Palm Beach letter. Understand crypto and see if it's part of your portfolio in the future. BigTReport.com. The Las Vegas Raiders have had a hell of a year for publicity. And, you know, it started with their coach getting caught saying the N-word and emails and getting fired. And then their wide receiver killing people. And now they've decided to up the ante. Now the Las Vegas Raiders have appeared to gone through an actual workout with Colin Kaepernick to vet him for a potential contract. Now, I know what you're thinking. Colin Kaepernick, oh, God, it's a story that actually involves him playing football and not just race shaming and denting the field grass with his knees. Well, I was just as surprised as you were. Yes, the Raiders. Ugh. If the Raiders happen to make the dumbest decision possible in bringing him onto the team, there is a very, very important lesson their management needs to understand. Before Colin Kaepernick took a knee, he lost his job to Blaine Gabbard. Because he sucks at football. Like, a lot. If you need help remembering that motto as well, then might I recommend an official Stu Does America t-shirt or mug that says as much. You can find it in a lot more at StuDoesMerch.com. Be sure to use the promo code Stu10. You'll get 10% off your order. We can't let Colin Kaepernick believe for a second that he's anything more than a crappy BLM marketing tool. Do your part and remind him that before, before he took a knee, he lost his job to Blaine Gabbert. StuDoesMerch.com. The promo code is Stu10 to get 10% off. You know, buying, buying, selling a home, whatever you're doing, it's already one of the most stressful things you can imagine. And it can be 10 times worse if you're not dealing with the right real estate agent. Generally speaking, our homes are our biggest investment. And that's a lot of responsibility. And you need to have an agent who can take it seriously. That's why I recommend realestateagentsitrust.com. Maybe you're Colin Kaepernick. Maybe you're going to be moving to Las Vegas soon. Maybe you need to have a home where you can employ lots of BLM activists and make sure they shame the Raiders and destroy the franchise when you leave, which obviously is what he's going to do when that occurs. Uh, If you have the best agent in your area, I don't know if they're going to work with you if you're Colin Kaepernick, uh, because you're probably pretty annoying if you're Colin Kaepernick, but maybe they will. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there. Get the best agent in your area. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now and check it out. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Hey, hey, what do you say? How is Alexandria victim today? 
Yes, Alexandria is a victim once again, this time of Elon Musk. Yes, you see, back in 2020, this, there was a time in which Elon Musk was seen as a left-wing figure. Do you remember this? Yeah, you know, he was the guy with the giant electric car company. Uh, he was a guy who was building spaceships to escape global warming. That guy who now inexplicably is seen as a right-wing figure, which I don't think is actually true. I mean, in fact, Elon Musk came out uh, just today and said he would favor uh, some uh, restrictions on AR-15 type weapons. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, like we've said this a million times on the show and I'm, you're probably sick of hearing it, but like, you know, Elon Musk is an interesting guy, but he is no conservative by any means. Anyway, um, AOC now is upset because she bought a Tesla back in 2020. I, how? I mean, I, she was from her bartender roots somehow was able to afford a, a really nice Tesla. And she wanted to get the Tesla because she needed to commute between uh, her district and Washington, D.C. And if you know anything about her district, which, you know, is in Queens, there's no public transportation for her to take. Uh, and certainly there's no way to get on public transportation from New York to Washington, D.C., uh, so she needed a Tesla, and now she's upset. She wants to switch it out, maybe for a Chevy Bolt, uh, which I guess is, is that still, is that still being made? Also, a, uh, or a, um, a Ford F-150 Lightning pickup truck, which would be hilarious to see her drive around. I, I'm all for it. I, I mean, look, you, you know, there are real Americans in this country who have waited over nine months, nine months to get a car. And are still waiting to this day, real Americans, with gas-powered engines that are loud. And yet AOC is switching out electric cars like crazy. Uh, the CBO is saying inflation is going to last. It's transitory, of course, but it's going to last until 2023 at least. So we've got that going on for us, which is very very nice. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. And I think the American people are as well, because Joe Biden has hit another low. We should just cover this every day. We could just do a segment every day on the new lows on Joe Biden's approval rating. Now down to 36 percent, 36 percent. That's the lowest it's been on the Reuters poll. And as we covered just a day or two ago, Joe Biden has the worst approval rating of any president at this time in his presidency. Uh, for a period that we have data that goes back to Harry Truman. If you're ever in Texas and you like burritos, might I recommend a place called Freebirds? Freebirds is it's a place I've only seen it really around Texas. Really good burritos, kind of like a Chipotle vibe, but I think it's better. Um, but they have this one incredible innovation there, which is they wrap your burrito in tinfoil. And then as you, they tell you, as you eat it from the top, the tinfoil, you just rip off little shreds of the tinfoil as you go down. So it keeps it together at the bottom, because as we all know, burritos fall apart and they go all over the place and your, your, your day gets ruined. Well, there was a guy, you may have seen this the other day, who came up with something. This is on the Internet and he's demonstrating it in a video. I think it was on YouTube where basically it's a funnel on top and you eat the burrito over the funnel and then it funnels down into what is standing underneath, which is a taco shell. So all the th stuff that falls out of your burrito goes into the funnel and then onto the taco. So you have a backup taco of all the stuff that fell out of your burrito. And that's a great idea, too. This is innovation. This is capitalism at work solving problems for you. However, now there's even another new step up in this process. London, four U.S. engineering students were brainstorming the perfect invention and they decided to come up with edible tape for your burritos. Now, it's in this picture. It's dyed blue, but it wouldn't have to be. And you could tape the burrito closed and then eat down and it wouldn't fall apart. This is incredible. This is the sort of innovation. I bet this is the type of thing we could come up with on the next Power Hour. I'm just saying you get a few drinks in and all of a sudden this type of idea starts coming out. Don't miss it, by the way. You can come and see it live. StuDoesPowerHour.com. StuDoesPowerHour.com. It's July 8th. We'll see you there.